chaos economy. Uh, and finally, I know this looks totally random, but why we need better maps. And hopefully all of these slightly odd uh, different strands of ideas will, will intertwine uh, in the next kind of 10 minutes or so, and you'll see what on earth I'm going on about. Um, first of all, the problem with data. So, you know, I, I am not just economics, but data editor. Uh, and so I spend a lot of time looking at numbers. Uh, I love numbers. I love charts. But, you know, we've also got to be aware that, you know, when people look at numbers, when they present data, often there's a sense that you've got this kind of monolithic truth there. You've got a number, therefore it must be true. And, you know, often data, often charts can tell you something pretty insightful. I mean, just this morning, um, we had labor market data coming out, which showed us, well, a few things. You had the payroll employees. That's more or less back to where it was before the pandemic uh, began. But look, hours worked across the economy. So this is just looking at total across the economy. And all I've done is I've rebased them to the start of the pandemic here. So you get the sense of just how things have changed versus that to where they are now. Hours worked not quite back to where they were before. But just look at this, vacancies. I mean, that is just the extraordinary chart, isn't it? Showing you part of what perhaps you're seeing in the labor market at the moment. The fact that vacancies are at the highest level they've ever been. This is just looking relative to the last, uh, to the start of uh, the pandemic, start of January uh, last year. But nonetheless, that level is also the highest it's ever been. And that's part of the various different crises that we're facing at the moment across the economy. It's not just one crisis. I mean, people talk, you know, and you know, to some extent, I think the, the media is guilty of this as well, is simplifying it down to one thing, a supply shortage or a supply crisis. But actually, it strikes me you've got kind of at least four crises, maybe more than that, four crises in one. You've got an energy crisis, so, you know, we all know about that at the moment, prices up to extraordinary levels. A distribution crisis, so getting stuff around is very difficult right now. Uh, you've got a labor crisis uh, at the moment, so in terms of actually getting people to do the work that you need to do, and then you've got a global supply crisis, and all of these things are kind of intertwined and they, they feed off into each other, but to some extent they are four separate stories. And when you look at certain different charts of what's going on with global prices, I mean, you, you heard in that panel a lot of concern about inflation right now. Let me show you a chart that kind of backs that up. And I've got another one coming up in a bit uh, that will do so as well. This is just showing you prices of certain key materials over the course of the last couple of years. So going, going back to April last year, start of the pandemic, over that period, metals prices across the world up by 77%, crude oil up by 200%. And I updated this about a week ago, so it may have gone up since then. Food prices up by 40%. And in any kind of normal period, you know, 40% increase in food prices over about 18 months would be considered quite a lot. But just look at what's happened to shipping costs over that period, up by 400%. And, you know, these are obviously global numbers. That's from the Shanghai uh, Shipping Index, up by 400% over that period. Put all of that together, and that all looks really quite inflationary, doesn't it? I mean, that's, you know, part of the, the, the story that we're undergoing right now. But it underlines, you know, we talked about distribution crisis, well, there you can see shipping up there, and then you've got an energy crisis with crude, and then you've got this kind of global supply crisis with other materials going up in price as well. All of that is starting to feed through into the prices that we're paying, but it takes a while to go through that kind of chain reaction. Now, I said that, you know, there are problems with data. It doesn't tell you definitively what's going on. Sometimes for certain stories, for certain charts, it is really instructive, but for other charts, uh, for other kind of uh, episodes, it's not necessarily telling you quite as definitive a story as you'd like to. The data is not always definitive, and framing matters. So let me give you an example of what I mean by framing. Remember the government has talked quite a lot recently about statistics like this. The UK is the strongest growing economy in the world. Uh, actually, well, they say in the G7. And they, they pull out statistics like this. And indeed, that is true. If you look just at the growth in Q2, there is the UK stronger than any other economy in the G7. But here's the thing, you know, the framing of that question really matters. Are you just looking at growth in the latest quarter or are you going to look at growth, com you know, where we are now compared with the start of the pandemic? Because if you do that, let's just look at that. Different framing, same statistics, same well, statistic well, GDP, different framing. What happens to that red bar? It goes down there. It turns out actually the UK is not the best in the G7. Actually, it's somewhere Spooky kind of there. mid, maybe lower table. Uh, and the US, these bars are just showing you how GDP now compares, or the latest okay, estimate compares with the start of the pandemic. Oh, right, and the UK no, kind of down there with Germany uh, and France, so doing pretty similar to the rest uh, of them. Now, framing matters also when it comes to some of the issues that we're trying to wrestle with at the moment. And we might talk about this, this a little bit more. Certainly it came up in uh, Ian's panel. This question of 
whether the UK is a low-wage, low-skill economy, and whether that's either problematic, whether that's an opportunity, whether it's something that we need to kind of do something about. The government talks about that a lot, about the idea of pulling us up with higher wages to be a higher wage economy. But let's just interrogate it and ask whether the data actually bears out that we are a low-wage economy economy. These lines here, all of these bars are just showing you different members of the OECD, so developed economies around the world, and you see the average over there. And the higher the bars are, the higher you're talking about average net income after taxes. In other words, on the basis of this, it looks like the UK is quite a high wage economy, not a low wage economy, because we're quite high up there. But here's the thing, OK? Same question again, looking at whether we're a low-wage or high-wage economy. Now look at the proportion of people who are low-paid. And this is just the higher these bars are, the more low-paid people there are of, as a proportion. And the UK is high up there. So it really depends on what question you're asking. You can ask one question you know, and, and you know, use that previous chart to suggest that we're actually high-wage. Or you could use this chart to suggest we're quite low-wage. And same thing with skills as well. This might be something that you've encountered. When it comes to you know, the skilled levels, this shows you low skilled, so the proportion of the population who have low skill uh, levels, so below secondary education. Um, and so the higher the bars are, perversely here, the higher the bars are, the more low skilled people there are. And the UK actually has quite a small proportion of low skilled people. So we actually have decent levels of skills when you look across the population. But here's the thing, OK? The question is whether those skills are appropriate for the job that someone wants to do, aren't they? You know, it's not that's really particularly useful having a degree in one thing uh, or indeed a qualification in one thing when you actually want to do another job. And that comes down to a statistic called skills mismatch, the extent to which those skills that you have or your applicant has are appropriate for the job that you want them to fill. The UK has the biggest skills mismatch or one of the biggest skills mismatch in the developed world. In other words, we have lots of very skilled people, but they're not necessarily skilled in the particular Thing that they need to be to get the job that people want them to do. So that, you know, you see it's a much more nuanced issue than I think a lot of people imply. And digging into the data sometimes helps you to understand that. But the other problem with data is that it's not always especially definitive. And I'm going to show you a chart here, actually. And I wonder if you can kind of guess what, what data we're looking at here. I'll give you a clue. So it starts in 1990. It goes to 2020. As you can see, lots of lines here. A bit of a dip there. But I don't know, can anyone guess what, what this is? What on earth this statistic is? It's a pretty, it's a pretty familiar one for all of us, because this is actually GDP. This is looking at every sector of the economy and their gross domestic product, gross value added. And just to underline that we really are talking about every sector here, and we've just rebased it back to 1990, let me show you some of these sectors. So IT and communications up, up an extraordinary amount. Soap and detergents, I didn't realize soap and detergents had done so well over the past uh, few decades. Soft drinks up a lot, uh, gambling there. But the point that I'm trying to make is when, you know, when people talk about GDP, they don't tend to talk about this as a big picture, a very complex picture across you know, 90, 100 different sectors of the economy, they just focus on one line. They focus on that line. And when we're doing a report on GDP, of course, we just talk about this line here. You can see COVID over there. And we focus on that line, and we tend to ignore what's going on beneath the surface because we've only got so much time. But the point that I want to make is that Looking beneath the surface, I think, is more important now. By the way, we, I'll just adjust the axis. There's, there it is. Same thing, GDP, but we've taken out all of the other lines. Looking beneath the surface is more important than it's ever been before. And I think we're starting to learn that with these kind of various different crises we're going through right now. Um, and that context is all important. Let me show you what I mean about that. So I'm going to take, show you GDP going all the way back to 1300. So this is kind of medieval GDP here. And what you can see is that for most of history, for century after century after century after century, it was basically flat. It wasn't doing much at all. People were not necessarily getting any richer, because that's you know, what, what GDP is ultimately. It's just the amount of income that we're earning across the economy, and then we divide it up by the number of people there. But it just basically wasn't doing anything. And then look what happened after kind of around 1850. It went up and up and up and up. And that really is the story of kind of capitalism and the story of welfare and the story of where we are 
today. We have got extraordinarily richer uh, over the course of the last 150, 200 years. And typically, when people talk about why that is, they'll talk about the Industrial Revolution. So you might talk about the invention of the spinning jenny and you know, mass production of cloth uh, around Manchester and other places. You might talk about the Bessemer process, so very relevant for where we are now, about still making, uh, or take it back to Abraham Darby. But the reality is, okay, when we look at this line and we just have our kind of pet theories about why it went up like that, often, you know, we have a tendency to simplify. And as I say, I work in a media where we need to try and explain something quickly, and that involves simplification. But the reality is, okay, let's zoom in on that line and think about the other things that were going on at the same time. It wasn't just steel making. It wasn't just the making uh, of cotton. It was also the chemicals revolution. So it wasn't just the industrial revolution. It was a chemicals revolution where you had processes like the Leblanc, Leblanc process, Solvay process, turning salt uh, into chemicals, saving millions of people's lives by making the world cleaner. We don't talk about this all that much, do we? But it's incredibly important uh, today. You've got uh, the invention of cement. Again, not discussed all that much, but this is the bedrock for the built world that we live in at the moment. And this was all happening at the same kind of period, as was the invention of aluminium. You know, again, incredibly important, but it was actually relatively late that we discovered how uh, to make aluminium, very energy intensive as well. Uh, nitrogen fixation, you know, feeding the world through the Harbour Bosch process, I mean, we've talked quite a lot about, about fertilizers recently on the news, more than we usually do, frankly. Um, but this is a key part, again, of civilization as we know it today. And here's the thing. I'm going to go just into the modern era there. 1947 transistors, you also had solar panels around the same kind of time, and lithium-ion batteries uh, in 1985. Here's the thing. We're not talking about a single industrial revolution. We're talking about various different revolutions across all parts of the economy. And here's another thing worth bearing in mind. Every single one of those different revolutions involves the creation, in terms of the processes, whether it's cement, whether it's the chemicals revolution, whether it's lithium ion batteries, whether it's solar panels, uh, whether it's aluminium, these are all very energy intensive, like incredibly energy intensive processes that also involve the creation of quite a lot of carbon. And one of the things that I think hasn't really been fully appreciated when we talk about you know, climate change is that we need to reconsider how to reimagine a lot of these different revolutions that we had, that we have achieved over, over the course of the past 200 years. And it's such a big deal. It's such a big deal. And we need to talk about it a little bit more. So let me get to that final point that I made about why we need better maps and what on earth I was talking about there. So I want to try and clarify that. We do a lot of talking, both in Sky News and in the world of economics, about these things, lines. Lines that show you whether GDP is going up, you saw one a moment ago. Lines that show you whether inflation is going up. Lines that show you whether people are getting richer. But I think, this is by the way, is by a guy called John Playfair. It's one of the earliest examples of charts. And I love it, it's so, it's, they're, they're so beautiful. Um, but we need to do a bit less of that and a bit more of this. We don't talk about maps enough when it comes to economics. And what do I mean by maps? We need better maps. What do I mean by maps here? Well, think about what we might be facing here. See, it's not the kind of map you were expecting, was it? Um, the threat of a potential bacon shortage uh, in the UK. Um, what is the map behind that? Well, there is a kind of chain reaction, isn't there, that's led to this potential bacon shortage. Partly there's the kind of labor thing we talked about a moment ago when it comes to kind of getting enough people to work, work within agriculture. But partly it's also this, the CO2 shortage. So not enough CO2. And why do we have not enough CO2? It's because fertilizer plants shut down. And why do fertilizer plants shut down? It's because of record energy prices. And why do we have record energy prices? Well, it's because of a whole range of factors. You know, not, not as much gas coming from Russia. Uh, you have problems with, uh, with the amount of gas that we're storing here. But also on top of that, on the other side of the world, in China, you've got coal mines being shut down and some of them being flooded recently. So when I talk about maps, what I mean is this kind of unexpected cascade, this chain reaction a chaos effect, where a butterfly wing flaps on one side of the world and then suddenly you're out of bacon on the other side of the world. Coal mines shut down, chain reaction all the way through. We don't understand that stuff very well, and I, you know, certainly within the world of economics. But the reason that I think it's you know, quite significant that we're here talking to you 
is that we want to try and understand it better. And I think it's businesses around the country that work within these supply chains that understand this stuff more intimately, certainly more intimately than the government, for whom this came as an enormous surprise, and more intimately than most of us. Let me give you one other example of another kind of chain reaction. Same thing again, Chinese coal mine shutdowns. Why is that going to have an impact on semiconductors? Because no one really, when people talk about semiconductor shortages, they're not talking about coal mining, but they should. Let me show you why. If you want semiconductors, if you want to make computer chips, you need silicon metal. If you want silicon metal, you need coking coal. A lot of coking coal goes into the production of silicon metal. I need silicon metal to make polysilicon, polysilicon to make silicon wafers, and silicon wafers to make semiconductors. This supply chain is not very widely understood, and yet it's incredibly important for the way the world fits together. And we need better maps of this kind of thing. And this is what I'm talking about. I'm going to show you one more chart, and then we're going to talk to um, Torsten Bell, who's uh, has been watching this probably with, with dismay about the idea of having to discuss all this random stuff. But Chinese coal sh mine shutdowns, silicon metal, this is all coming our way in terms of semiconductor shortage. Right now, the shortage that we have is largely happening within places like Taiwan. It's in fabs that basically aren't able to produce enough to kind of keep the automobile sector uh, supplied. But this side of things, we don't talk about enough. But let me show you what's happening to silicon metal prices. So that, that metal that you need coal for, it's been more or less flat for most of recent history. This goes all the way back to 2016. But just recently, in sept on, earlier on September, there was a production cut of silicon metal uh, in Yunnan province in China, where a lot of this stuff is produced. Just look at what happened to the silicon metal price. And that's something that's very rarely remarked on. It's something where people aren't really putting those pieces together and trying to understand how that is about to come down the road to us. But when we talk about inflation, when we talk about the state of the economy, this is the kind of thing uh, that we should be discussing. So with that in mind, I mean, we have a whole range of different things we've discussed there. We've discussed the state of the UK labour market. We've discussed uh, the extent to which we have shortages. We've discussed what happens within supply chains and whether we have a good understanding of them. Um, I want to bring in Torsten Bell from the Resolution Foundation, uh, who should be down the line uh, from uh, Westminster, who I hope has been listening to some of that, uh, and I uh, probably with, 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 with some uh, trepidation. Uh, I want to start, actually, Torsten, by asking you about that question of the labour market, the question of you know, whether we do have a kind of low-wage, low-skill economy, and kind of where we are on that particular uh, path. Well, I mean, I think there's, some, there's obviously some good news in that space, Ed, which is, you know, what have we learned over the last, what have we lost over the last 20 years is that, yes, we have been a country with more low-paid, hourly low-paid people than most similar countries, but actually having now decided to introduce a minimum wage at the end of the last century and then to aggressively ramp it up under this government over the last five years, we've actually seen a very big fall, the first fall in low pay for four decades and it's happened without big losses in employment so we've learned that the country had a problem and that policy was able to make a very big difference to that and that you know these are not small fry amounts of money for people you know even just looking at the rise since 2016 a full-time minimum wage worker will be well over a thousand pounds a year better off because of that policy change so things so things are starting to to improve but how about where we are now? So you've got, obviously, universal credit cut. That is going ahead, or at least the kind of temporary uplift bit going. Uh, energy price is incredibly high right now. To what extent are you seeing the potential for real kind of pain across the labour market and that lower pay side of it uh, over the course of the next few months? Well, I think the whole country is set for a difficult autumn on the cost of living side. You know, everyone will know seeing their prices going up faster than they are used to, and obviously energy prices, partly reflecting some of what you were saying earlier, Ed, are obviously the, the poster boys for the, the cost of living crunch that is coming. Big rise just happened last week on energy prices and another one coming in April. The, um, so you've got prices going up. I think the thing that is particularly bad for low-income households is that for them, the price going up will be accompanied by their income going down, 
because of the cut to universal credit that happened last Wednesday, and that will be biting for families right across the next, the next month as their lower benefit payments come through. And we're not talking about a small change, we're talking about £1,000 a year for well over 4 million households, on average people losing 5% of their income overnight. So yeah, I think it is a really tough autumn coming. It's a tough autumn for everybody because everyone has to pay their energy bills, but it's particularly tough for lower middle incomes households who those areas of spending, food and energy, are particularly large amounts of their spending. And as I say, for lots of them, their income's coming down too. And so since you had to sit through, like, like our, our excellent audience here had to sit through my slightly random uh, set of charts about supply chains, about energy, about all of these different factors, I just wanted to get your take uh, on that. I mean, you know, we're living in a world now where these things seem to be cropping up quite a lot. And I wonder, you know, does, does, does Brexit play a part in that? That's been one of those things that's just been discussed. Do we, do, we, do we have the right kind of, are we looking at the right things to understand what's coming down the line? You know, I thought your um, economic and science history lesson was actually uh, really valuable because one of the things I think that we need to just understand is modern economies are very complex, okay? And in general, we have spent the last kind of 40, 50 years moving away from the idea of planning our economy, moving away from the idea that the government does understand those supply chains that you were drawing out and moving towards a liberal view, which is the job of government is to provide stability and then we should leave individuals and firms to make those supply chains work well because trying to plan them is beyond, uh, is beyond what is possible from sitting with a spreadsheet in Westminster. And in general, obviously, that's true because as you illustrated, Ed, there's lots of complex interactions in supply chains that economists aren't going to understand. And you don't have to be very liberal to think uh, that it's beyond the wit of a central planner to get it right when it's guessing what the future looks like. So in general, that's true. Where that becomes difficult is when big shocks happen, when big change happens. And you saw that in the financial crisis when everybody who previously loved financial innovation and complex financial products suddenly decided that those products were a real risk to the financial stability of the country and that we didn't well understand them. And the version of that this time is that not understanding our industrial supply chains in particular is proving very difficult when we've been through two years of turning our economy off and turning it back on again. And that is then causing us a whole world of problems, which you illustrated very, uh, very neatly. Obviously, the UK is unusual in that the economic change we're going through is the ones that other big developed countries are going through, which is net zero plus COVID. And we are adding to that the big change that Brexit brings. And I think stepping back and thinking about the 2020s, I think it is really important to think about it in the way you set out, because this is not just, oh, can we please get back to some kind of vague normal after these crises. It's about recognising that the 2020s is an era of unusual economic change as Brexit, Covid, net zero all happen at once. And that does bring new economic challenges, understanding changes to these supply chains, understanding how some kinds of workers are going to be asked to make bigger changes in their lives than we're used to. Because I know everyone says, oh, you know, change has been speeding up for decades. That actually isn't true. It's actually let, we've been seeing less change in most aspects of our economy over recent decades. And I think that's why the next decade is a particularly big challenge for us, because a lot of change is coming. Thank you. Okay, that's, that's fascinating, Torsten, and glad, glad to hear that I wasn't t talking total rot there. The audience here will be very reassured to, to get your expert take uh, on that. And uh, thank you very much for appearing at Big Ideas Live. Thank you, Torsten Bell from the Resolution Foundation there uh, from London. Now, I, I just want to finish off by, by saying that, you know, as Torsten was, was saying, understanding this stuff is going to be really important for, for all of us. We are, you know, at the forefront of trying to explain this stuff. But the reason that we're trying to come and talk to as many people as possible is that we think this is not necessarily a well-developed and well-understood part of the way the economy actually fits together. And genuinely, the government doesn't either. I know people within number 10, within the Treasury, who are only beginning now to try to piece together those maps I was talking about right then. It's not about having maps like that so you can intervene. 
it's about having maps so you can understand, I mean, you know, go to intervene if you wanted to, but it's about having maps so you can understand what is going on, what's coming down the line, what is the impact going to be of decarbonisation, what's the impact going to be of Brexit. Our intelligence of this is really quite primitive at the moment, and so the more we can try to understand that, the better we're going to understand the economy, which is why, you know, random as it is, I think that we need more maps. Now, later on, uh, my colleague Sam Washington is going to be talking to, to Mark Carney. It's going to be really interesting, given his part, uh, obviously, in global um, affairs at the moment. He was obviously central bank governor uh, in the UK. Uh, after that, now he's gone on uh, to an environmental role where he is looking uh, at the financing uh, when it comes to uh, carbon, when it comes to climate change uh, in COP. So, oh, Sam, you're behind me. <laughs> so you so Sam's, Sam's here. Good morning, everybody. I'm Samantha Washington. I'm a news presenter at Sky News, sometime uh, business presenter and climate show presenter as well. Uh, thank you very much, Ed, there. Uh, Ed, of course, our economics editor, our data editor, and Sky News' resident geek as well.